is going to be your required skill set for all of us. Tonight's discussion is going to help us understand the complexities of discerning what's true and what's false. As we remind you always, the forum programs are free to the public, which is why we seek your support to bring all of these speakers here. We are launching our 2020, 2023 fundraising campaign this year with a letter or a meet and email to most of you. And we truly, truly appreciate your contributions. Just go to our website, salisburyforum.org, hit the donate button, and select how you would like to. And thank you very much. So coming attractions. On Friday, October 27th, at the Housatonic Regional High School, we will have Mary Rassenberger, who is the CEO of the Authors Guild, and she is going to be speaking on the future of books in an age of artificial intelligence, or AI. It promises to be a very compelling discussion about an issue that's going to reshape all of our lives. So let me now turn to Susan Hassler for her, she's publisher and CEO of the Lakeville Journal, for mm -hmm. her welcome. Jewish publisher of the Lincoln Journal, um, having succeeded um, Jenna Nankum, who was a publisher for many, many years. And, um, and after many years of scarcity, the Lincoln Journal is in the process of rebuilding. So we're in the process of rebuilding the newsroom, we're in the process of rebuilding our website, and we're, we're in a place now that instead of having you know, three or four people who are scrambling around to like try to <coughs> try to cover everything, we're trying to get more people involved who are reporters and writers. And, and that part of it is, it, it's a very exciting moment to be at the journal. And it's also the militant news, right? Our sister publication is the news. So we're trying to build them out 
um, in, in, in a way that reflects uh, all of the energy and all of the things that are going on in our community. So um, you will find in your seat, um, if we're talking about money, <laughs> um, a, a thing about a, a matching campaign that we're doing right now. We've had um, people, including Meryl Street, who've given us over $100,000 over matching, or matching the amount that they put out by the end of this month. And um, we will have to continue to ask for money because the amount of money that we can make from advertising and circulation will never actually, we can't close the gap. So every year there's a gap, $250,000, $300,000 a year that we have to close. So um, I'm really glad that this is going to be fun. And, and, I'm, and I'm really happy to be here. So, tonight we are very honored to have an esteemed panel to sort out fact from fiction. First of all, we want to note that we did have a woman on this stage. <laughs> uh, Cynthia. She's McCann. fine. <laughs> we didn't do anything with her, I promise. <laughs> She's fine. She, she is the senior legal and investigative correspondent for NBC News, but she had a very rigorous fall travel schedule and was not able to be here tonight. So. Fortunately for all of us, we have Brian. <laughs> so Brian is going to moderate the panel. He has served for more than four decades as a television correspondent, for 20 years with NBC, and then as chief investigative correspondent at ABC until 2018. Brian's work has earned numerous awards, including Peabody's and Emmys and the Edward R. Murrow Award. He's had a home in Sharon for many years, and you can hear him on the weekly Real News show on Robin Hood Radio. Joining Robin, or joining Brian, <laughs> is John Costin, the editor-in-chief of the Lakeville Journal. John is the former news editor at, on the National Desk at the Wall Street Journal, where he worked for 33 years. Both Brian and John were on our on our journalism panel last September, a year ago. And also returning to the Salisbury Forum for the second time is Kurt Anderson, who I'm watching partially, uh, a renowned author of a number of books, including the New York Times bestseller, Fantasyland, in which he describes the American instinct to believe in fantasy. Kurt also co-founded Spy Magazine and co-created and hosted the Peabody Award winning <coughs> radio show Studio 360. And finally, we are joined by two playwrights from New York City, sitting on the end, Jamie Carrican and Jeremy. Right. Jeremy. Right. It's Jeremy. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. Jeremy Carrican and David Morell, who have been writing together for 30 years, often from different cities at the same time. <laughs> Both are graduates of the University of Chicago, and they began writing Lifespan, Lifespan of a Fact in 2012, shortly after the book of the same title was published. The play received the Outer Critics Circle John Gasner Playwriting Award. So please join me in welcoming Brian. to your own opinion, you are not entitled to your own facts. But in fact, true today, facts help shape our opinion, but all too often, it seems, opinions are shaping our facts. So I want to talk to each of our panelists to start with a question about truth in journalism. Let me start with you, Jeremy. From what you hear and read in the news, how much do you think is true? <laughs> I've got uh, two frustrating and all the contradictory answers. Um, I think most of it is probably a truth, uh, and almost none of it is the truth, and getting less all the time, but probably not for the reasons you think. David? Um, by design, this is a quick question, so probably this, I can qualify this further along, but I would say uh, I think less than half is true. Less than half. John Costello, what would you say? Uh, well, I was going to say 68%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
What has changed in the last 20 years, in my experience, is that uh, we 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 have a ubiquitous news source now. It's it's everywhere, and it has begun to be aggregated in a way that, so that you can you can know a story and have done it yourself, and then the next day read uh, your, your phone will tell you here's the new version of that story by somebody else, and. The person who was arrested uh, for a pretty sad crime is identified as a town employee of the town, which is complete fabrication. It's not at all true. So I, that's why I come up with 68%. I have no idea uh, how much is true. I think uh, the, the, the lifespan of a fact is an amazing document uh, and play that exposes this whole concept of fantasy and wish fulfillment and yearning for some understanding of the world. And that's pretty much a dodgy answer, but I don't right, I'll take that, Kurt. Um, I think 68% is not bad. Yeah. Um, I, I, I actually am more, for all of the uh, hogwash in, that has come into what passes for the mainstream of news media these days. I think the, <laughs> what, what is now called legacy media, the, the, the responsible news media organizations that were the responsible news media organizations for my lifetime are still responsible news media organizations that are with the profession of journalism mostly searching for the truth. Uh, a truth, the truth, that's a whole argument we can have. But I think there is about many things, and we should, it's a better default to have, is that there is the truth about facts uh, and about what happened. And I think that um, beyond, beyond the sheer facts, I think that as aggravated as I am about the way this newspaper headlined this or the way they distill their news stories on in this social media post or whatever, I think the, the good faith effort to search for the truth is still here. Now, but how did you enjoy the play? This is Lincoln is the question, and we have, for instance, Fox News, um, which is so reckless in its disregard for anything like the truth. And, and again, they're not the only entity, but they are, in my view, the most, in terms of news, quad news, and things calling themselves news, the Fox, Fox News, it, the most egregious uh, violator of that. So it's, it's a different situation than it was 25 years ago, but I, I, I do not entirely despair yet that we don't have facts uh, that we can assume present those things. Uh, Jeremy and David, in your brilliant play, Lifestyle of Fact, you posit a author has written a great piece. It's fact-checked, and the fact-checker says it may be as much as 50% wrong, and the author says, but it's the truth. So if an article is 50% wrong, can it be 100% true? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure you want to start with that? Well, I think this is, a, I think this is where I'll qualify my answer about <clears throat> thinking that less than 50% of what uh, of news is can be called true. What we have here is tonight, both the play and also now the panel, um, we have this diet, we have these two words, fact and truth. So what's going on? Um, I think that when you speak, when we're talking about journalism, fact and truth are different than when we're talking about the world of the essay as, as John believes it to be. I'm sorry, you haven't seen the play yet. As a, our main character sees it to be. Where he also speaks about fact and truth. And I think there's two different things going on. In journalism, I think the goal is that fact and truth be the same thing. Um, so that, um, you know, most of us, unless you're a conspiracy theorist or someone who thinks we're in, living in a simulation, like some Philip K. Dick thing where it's hallucinatory, um, you could, it, it is funny, but I, you know, it, it's a serious, point. serious too, you know, um, if you're in, in the, the norm, as I suspect most of us here are, if I hear Fox and MSNBC report that Congress yesterday passed a particular bill, um, I am going to treat it as a fact. I, I'm not going to think it's a conspiracy or a delusion. You know, I'm going to basically treat it as a fact. And therefore, it is also true. 
And that's the journalistic ideal, that something being called a fact is also true. And sort of ding, 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 you know, pinball machine goes off. That's journalism has now been good. Um, and then very quickly, with no, no bad actors, no, no one's a bad guy here, um, you get to something where you could hear that yesterday, yesterday seven people were shot in Brooklyn. Um, <clears throat> and that's being, and again, no bad guys, that's being more or less presented in the headline as seven people were shot in Brooklyn yesterday. But the fact really being asserted is that police report that seven people were shot in Brooklyn yesterday. That's the fact. Um, and again, police being the good guys here, no, no, no villains. But the fact is, there may be, in fact, ha, um, it may be the case that three other people were shot in Brooklyn that no one knows about. And so the police are unable to say that. So the truth is that 10 people were shot in Brooklyn yesterday. But the fact is that seven people were shot. And in that case, journalism, and no one has done anything wrong, journalism has fallen short of its ideal. So the ideal of journalism is that fact and truth be the same thing. Whereas, hopping over to the other category of our main character, John Degada, who's an essayist who believes it's an art form, um, he does not have the same goal that a journalist has, that, faith, that fact and truth be the same thing. He is concerned only with what he considers to be truth. And, if, and it's a matter of more or less indifference to him whether that lines up with facts. Because if um, the day that an important thing happens, he wants the sun to set and cast a golden hue on the side of a skyscraper, he's going to have that be the case in his essay. And if you then go back and check the weather reports and it turns out that that evening, it was in fact very overcast or even drizzly and there was no setting sun that cast a golden hue, he really doesn't care. Because the truth for him that may tie into other themes in his essay involving gold and sun and prosperity and hope, it's important that the sun make the side of the, the building be gold. Um, and um, so he does not have the same goal that a journalist has for fact and truth to line up. If they line up, that's fine. And if they don't, really, what he views as the truth is more important. Jeremy? Yes, uh, there is, uh, there's a disparity between this kind of accuracy. Uh, the, the, what is of, of, the, of the facts, of the numbers, whereas a poet may be concern, concern, more concerned with truth with a capital T. How does this make one feel? How this is all part of a truth. And, we, and people are talking today um, about their own their own personal truths. And it's it, you know, and these are narratives that we tell ourselves, and they're becoming more and more important in among the kids today. And the, and people will say it. And this is my this is my truth, as though it is fact. And we posit that those are not the same things. And but everybody does this. Everyone rewrites their own history to fit their own narratives. And so we can sit here thinking we love fact more than the guys at Fox or the guys at Fox and say we love it more than MSNBC. But they're all rewriting things even in their own head. And that's, that's what we're getting to, is what, 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 what do you mean truth, what do you mean fact? John Costin, uh, when you supervised your reporters at the Wall Street Journal, and now at the Lakeville Journal, uh, when you insisted on an absolute dedication to the facts, or would you allow a little uh, slip and slide there to make sure you got to the truth that the author no. saw? Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, I just had to mention that I worked in a building in the last 10 years or so on 1211 Avenue of the Americas. Can you lift the mic up to those? I didn't forget. Louder? Is that better? Yes. So I worked at the headquarters of Fox News, uh, and the fair and balanced uh, message was, was everywhere, along with, uh, uh, you know, Simpsons, you know, the Simpsons. So we had this <laughs> bizarre, the world in which you, you thought about these lofty thoughts, and then it was uh, uh, but but the newspaper had has a long history uh, of being a business newspaper. So it's the daily diary of the American American business, and you can't really fool around with facts when it comes to business because people lose money when you do that. And so Chicago Board of Trade has to be covered. 
uh, completely, truthfully, and accurately, or you'll be out of business. So when Bloomberg came along with his terminals, we got all excited because we noticed that there were certain more mistakes being made coming out of that, so people were maybe less inclined to rely on the truth of those numbers. But the journal then decided to become a competitor with the New York Times, and that was under Rupert Murdoch. So we began to sort of branch out and do more of different kinds of stories, but we still had that uh, very neutral uh, approach, which is what are the facts here? And you have to verify facts twice. You can't just run on one. I had a long conversation uh, probably in the 90s uh, with someone at the journal who had been there during this sort of big period of success. And he noted to me how we had gone from being 100% factual verification to 90%, and we're now like down around 80% in terms of just making sure that this story is 100% solid. If it's 80% solid, we, we might well go with it. And so that, that is a change that, that came about. But it's interesting to share that when Rupert Murdoch came and everybody thought, oh, this is the end, a lot of our best people left, left uh, fearing that it was the end. Uh, but he really couldn't mess with any of the business journalism because it's business. Kurt Anderson, uh, you have in your book, Fantasy Man, sort of documented Americans kind of like it from P.T. Barnum to Donald Trump. They don't mind a little razzle dazzle. In the largest sense of culture, they, they thrive on it. And, and their religion becomes show business, and some of their media becomes show business, and, and that is the way it was ever thus. I just want to say, though, that I think it is. I think what you're probably saying, John, when, when, when the, for instance, you say, oh, what to 90% fact checkable fact, but we're not talking about, as we see in the play, as we see in the, in, the, in the true life story on which the play is based, the writer saying, ah, it doesn't matter if it was this kind, it doesn't matter if the color was this, it doesn't matter if this happened then. See, and I, I think that the binary, you know, as, as I, I think the binary distinction between truth and fact, not truth and fiction, fact and fiction, and I write, by the way, novels as well as nonfiction, so I'm acutely aware of these things. Um, the, the binary distinction is really important, and if you're writing something like non, if you're writing nonfiction, to say, eh, it doesn't matter, this goes better with what I'm trying to get at, and as you're suggesting, in terms of the golden sunset of Las Vegas or whatever. Find a fact. Find a correct, don't, don't resist correct facts. And I'm sure, at, I hope, at no time did the news section, the non-editorial page sections of the Wall Street Journal say, eh, no, facts don't matter anymore. Now, journalism, of course, is a matter of, I'm not pretending it's there's an objective truth and that's what it's always getting. Of course not. It's A, rough draft of history, and the drafts get less rough over time. And B, every journalist selects, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to foreground this fact, or I'm going to and that is a version of shaping the facts to present what one hopes what you think is the best, most fair-minded version of the truth that you can present. But the fact that John, the character, and the person, but you may tell me that he's not really the person and it's all fiction, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, that his recklessness and his, his, his kind of, to me, uh, pretentious, and, uh, uh, taking on of I'm not a journalist, I'm not writing nonfiction, I'm writing art, therefore I can do whatever I want. Well, and as his fact checker uh, character insists, know that then readers will assume that they can't trust anything. And, and, and to me, again, this guy, and a guy, people like him, and people regard what they do as art, and therefore they could, don't have to adhere to facts, when there are facts to adhere to, and this guy, this other person, this other character, this fact checker is saying, this is a fact, eh, screw you, I don't care, I'm gonna go with what I want. That's really problematic to me, and it, it is part of a problematic shift in, in the culture at large, and, and including journalism, over the last generation or two, uh, where, where facts don't matter. To me, in journalism and in nonfiction, facts do matter, 
And you'll get things wrong, inevitably. Every, every newspaper article I've ever read about, say, me, or something I've done, has <laughs> error. And that's, that's the nature of the game. But, but, but willful errors, because you think it sounds better, or it fits with your theme better, is, is problematic. And I, and I don't accept the, and I, I, I find it untenable to, I, I want to stop that, that, that you know, change of the paradigm. When you wrote your play, it came out in 2018, uh, you chose that topic, was there a reason for that? Why did you decide to write that play about that subject? Were you responding to Fox News, to Donald Trump? Yeah. No, we, we started in 2012, 2013. We, uh, David, David called me because the, there was a book review in the New York Times that was ang so angry at John DeGata for even considering this stuff that she sounded just like Kurt Anderson just now. <laughs> it was, and we both thought that review, we both thought that review was funny because passion can frequently well, make us laugh. Uh, but it's we went and we got the book and we thought it was hysterical. We thought it was um, we thought it was a very funny concept. And we have two we have an Im immovable force. And an un, or sorry, an unstoppable force and an immovable object in John and Jim, the characters. And it just, it seemed inherently dramatic. And uh, so many angry reviewers, and so many angry reviewers that, that I, they, I, we thought Frankenstein rakes and pitchforks were coming for John. And um, so John posits there is a, another, another creature out there called creative nonfiction which is a, takes a little more leeway with the facts in, in, uh, in pursuit of poetic truth. He, he and it has a long history, Cicero, uh, on forward through Sontag. Right. And he won't call his article an article. He refuses to, he call, refuses it. to call it an article. Not an article. It's, it's an, an essay. essay. And it's full of, he acknowledges, he made things up because it flows better. It's a little more creative. The but then he does to get to the truth is his argument. That's his argument. And it's a very difficult argument to, uh, to, to stand for, for some people. And John's not at all like the character in the play or the book, oddly enough. Uh, but um, David, we're left wondering at the end, is the article published? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> very nice. In the world of the play, not necessarily. Yeah, in the world, I mean, everyone knows that in real life it was published, but this, the play, is not the real world. Um, you know, we purposely, you know, sorry, I'm giving away the end. We, we don't say at the end of the play whether it's published or not. It's obviously deliberate, uh, because we want people to talk about it over dinner afterwards and on the car ride on the way home. The Avengers show up at, at, in my world. <laughs> Do they? <laughs> um, I feel like I have a microphone with nothing to say. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, that was purposeful. Oh yeah, very personal. You yeah. wanted people to think about this notion that it could be largely untrue, but true. Well, uh, I don't want to speak for Jeremy personally. I think it is unresolvable. I think it's mostly you know Kurt has weighed very strong, you know, very articulately on, on one side. Um, but we have met just as many people who feel more or less the opposite that they are on John Degata's side, um, and they. But they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if we had, you know, just art, artistically, it sounds so pretentious, just, you know, as people trying to make money off of ticket sales, we, <laughs> we thought um, it would have, we should not weigh in on one side or the other, that that would have been a mistake, and it's better for everyone to think about it themselves, and for us to present as strong a case as we could, more or less, for both sides. I, I'm actually going to say, we, you said we don't step in on either side, but, and you say it's insoluble, and didn't want to speak for me, so I'll speak for me now. And then I think, A, it's insoluble, but I have also taken all of the sides that at, at some point in, in writing these, in writing the, in writing and building the play, I felt honestly that each of these people, each of the three people on the stage is right. So, and I had to, I, I had to superposition my soul to think that way, and I still do. I still simultaneously think they're all right, and I'll go to the grave thinking that. John Costin, one of the criticisms of journalism from Sundown is that both sides, you don't have to put both sides in, 
because that's not really the truth. It's just you're being uh, sort of treating each side equally, and that's wrong. How do you feel about that? Fair and balanced uh, is a <laughs> phrase that is used all the time, but it's great irony. Exactly. Fox News calls itself fair and balanced. <clears throat> there, there have been times when, uh, if you're covering a political campaign and you are in somewhere in Iowa at a fair and you talk to two Democrats, that you then are somehow obligated to go talk to two Republicans. Uh, that is. That happens all the time. And then it gets to a tricky point because in the newsprint business, newspaper business, uh, you don't have unlimited length except on the web. So you have to start cut something out to include a, non a nonsensical comment from uh, one party or the other just to sort of say that you're balanced. Um, that, that I, have, I have in all my years really not seen that as a big problem. Uh, I don't know whether it, it uh, will come around as a problem. Uh, I think the, not trying to change the subject here, but I think one of the big problems when we talk about who's right in the, of all three or two, is that the, the reader really should be deciding that. And that's the way I approach things now, which is, uh, we, we cover community issues, community journalism, and so we end up with a lot of quote-unquote facts, uh, facts about affordable housing, facts about poverty in, in our region, facts about whatever. And, but there is still a bigger story, which is the, you know, the long-term threat of an affordable housing crisis that we're now in. So, I'm not going to go into that, it's just that the idea is that there's a sort of fact-based look at things, but if you, if you try to then extrapolate what's the truth of that, uh, the reader has to decide. And I think my whole approach to all this forever has been uh, just give people the information and let them decide for themselves. Kurt, if it's balanced completely, does it block the truth? Uh, well, it's balanced in, in many ways, and, and, and I think we have to stipulate that until six years and nine months ago, we did not have a president of the United States and a political party that he represents being so, as a matter of, I wouldn't even call it ideology, but approach to the world, uh, disregarding uh, truth and fiction and fantasy and fact. And, 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 and absolutely intermingling. You know, if, if, if this, I mean, when this book came out in the pre-Trump era, uh, when you started the play in the pre-Trump era, I would, it wouldn't have made me angry. The character would, would have been entirely, as you said, uh, that's a funny, slightly pretentious character who wants to not be a non-fiction writer, but wants to be some other kind of artist. Yeah, sure, that's funny. And that conversation is great. And I'm not saying he caused let's say, Donald Trump. But <laughs> I, I do think that in the last, in this decade, the last seven, eight years, it's become a whole different question. This, this panel is a different question, is, a different, is, is addressing a different subject than it would have 10 years ago. Now, Fox News preceded all this and, and, and softened up the ground in its, you know, unfair and unbalanced uh, treatment <laughs> of, 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 of a version of news that so often was so selective and so partisan and so everything that it, 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 it helped solve the ground for a, a Donald Trump and the modern Republican and the current Republican Party. But that's where we are. So that's why I get angry. And that's why, you know, uh, I mean, I started writing my book fans on it before there was Donald Trump, you know, 2013, 14, when you were writing, you started writing the play. And, and to me, it was then like, oh, this is an interesting. This has always been part of the, of the American character, the national character, I think, to have a kind of iffy grip on facts and <coughs> entertainment to, to, to factual truth. But, but it became, as we now say, weaponized. It became consequential. Who cares if it was P.T. Barnes and you went to his museum and he showed you a fake mermaid hat, whatever. <laughs> uh, or who cares if, if uh, 
certain kinds of religious people had their own versions of reality that did not conform to, say, scientific reality. Fine, they're in their churches. Once that all enters the public sphere, it's a whole different question and becomes dangerous and problematic. And is Fox News dangerous in your view? Well, was when it started, it has been, and I mean, almost, yes, absolutely, no question, it's dangerous, and it has, I, no single institution, certainly in news, has been more responsible for uh, corroding the solidarity of the American people in our republic, period. And yes. John Costa, what would you say as a former employee of the Murdoch Empire? <laughs> <laughs> I think I got this question at the last I I also do not bring up any kind of fair and balanced uh, phraseology to trigger uh, uh, my colleague here but it is uh, it is ludicrous and I think uh, I, I watch Fox and CNN and MSNBC and they all are kind of in there, they all have problems. But uh, Fox is in another planet, and uh, I don't see, I, th I think the, you know, if you, if you start to invoke some notion of what is true about life in America, it has to do with educational levels. And so you have all these people who have been transfixed by Fox News. I've traveled all, all over the country quite a bit, and uh, wherever you go, Fox News is the preferred channel. Except at the Canaan Country Club, by the way. Uh, on Monday nights, they have a steak thing, and then and they have football. So uh, it, it is it is a sad. I I because I'm running a local newspaper, I tend I tend to focus on what really matters and what's relevant for everybody here in this audience, and so uh, it's it kind of puzzles me and I want to, I hope that we can have some more conversations about it. How, how do you care about what's going on in national, at the national level? Because we really should care about what's going on on our level. That's my mission anyway. So uh, the, the whole question that's on the table here about making up or having a grandiose notion of what you're writing uh, doesn't even come across my desk at the Lakeville Journal. We, we just don't even have anything like that. And that's a, a wonderful thing. Uh, what we do lack, however, is the ability to sort of dig a little bit below the surface and see what might really be going on. I think, I, I, I speculate in my, as I go to bed at night, hoping that all of our public officials are good people. Um, <laughs> because we really can't, we don't have the resources to be the watchdog that we might want to be. So the whole issue of fair and balanced, sorry, I need to trigger you. No, yeah. uh, <laughs> nothing is, is uh, it, it doesn't really come across our desk right now. Uh, we, we are really dedicated to reflecting what's going on in the community and doing our best to do that. It's not a sales pitch. Uh, but it doesn't have to do with somebody trying to show off other than once in a while our fishing colonist who does very good job. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to say a little bit about what's the most dangerous and pernicious thing that's happening to journalism. And I think it happened a long time ago, and I don't think we realize it. I think it's television. It started that way. You know, I've been reading a lot of uh, Robert Cialdini lately and uh, decision theory and the like, and just one of the, the phrase that keeps coming back to my mind is everyone assumes that which is focal is causal. That if you see it, they're the ones that did it. Uh, people, if you see a taped confession and the tape, you know, anybody you see on a confession, they're the ones that did it. That's what you think. And anywhere that camera is pointed, they they fooled you into thinking they're the, that's the most important thing in the world. It's too easy to to break your brains with video. I worked in a television editing room for a long time. I was a researcher for Inside the Actors Studio for 20 years, and we helped edit the we helped edit the show. And the only things that we could control in that editing room were space and time. I think human brains have become less critical because of the image. Uh, 
I think, and we, and we get more and more images flooding our brain every day with the internet. So an uncritical mind and mass visual media, I think, is the worst thing that's happened. David, let me ask you that. I will defend television if I could. But um, would you write the play the same way, uh, given uh, what we've seen from this last president and Fox News? Yes, we would. We very carefully divorced it from any current events and tried to treat it as an abstract project. I cut, I cut off, um, I, I think, tried to treat it as an abstract project. We, uh, we purposely never mentioned Trump. We also very purposely never have uh, fake news in it um, and because we didn't want it to, because we all know 15 years from now that's going to sound dated. You know, we don't want it to sound dated. 50 years from now. So, it, it, so I, in an ideal world, wouldn't change anything because really nothing that's happened since then, to me, changes what we're saying and we're doing it as a project. But it does close October 15th, so the box office. <laughs> <laughs> you know what is going to go on. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you, for where do you see uh, the news business, the news industry, five years from now? Well, first of all, right, TV. I would sort of say, I, yes, that was a huge change. I, I, I would argue, though, that with 24-7 cable news and the internet coming along at the same moment was the thing that changed it into this, into, into this new condition that we have never experienced before as any society has. It was dangerous, now it's monstrous. Something like that. And, and well, which is true, too, of what I regard to be the Venezuelan problem, which is we were always nutty. We didn't have the internet to enable the nuts and crackpots to gather and recruit and, and present all kinds of fakery as though it's as real as anything else on the internet. So that's, that's a new condition. Um, uh, I, again, I, I, you know, I mean, I, the hopeful part of me goes, look, look at the Wall Street Journal, look at the New York, and, and, I, and I, of course, excluding the real pages, which I also read. A lot of watching Fox News. You're but triggering yourself again. No, I'm not <laughs> triggering. I have certain feelings and opinions. <laughs> uh, uh, and the New York Times, great. Atlantic, great. You know, they're, they're the, as I say, the great entities, journalistic entities that were there for my lifetime are still there and doing great work. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not hopeless. So the, the, the problem is to me when, when. People stop distinguishing, as most people don't, because most people don't come to towns like this and pay attention. Stop distinguishing between all of the information and information and news and news that comes to them through the internet, right? I mean, it was the problem to me with television was that suddenly, for the first time, everything was coming through the same box: fiction, plays, movies, news, everything. And so that was a new thing, and so it was all mingled and jumbled up. Now, the you know, your, telephone, your, your phone screen, your, your, your laptop, your, your, your desktop screen plays that. And so the, the, the need, which has always existed for a kind of critical media eye, is even more difficult for people to, to carry out. And, and, and at this point, you know, at the high end of your character and person, John, at the low end of whatever the low end is, uh, people think, no, whatever I believe in my heart or feel in my heart, or think I can get uh, views and clicks on, is what I'm going to, whether I believe sincerely and delusionally is true, is true, or what I can make money if you're Rupert Murdoch or whomever, uh, and will present as true. So the larger info world, information news ecology, is troubling, troublesome, you know, I mean, it, how much worse? Well, I think it's gotten pretty much as bad as it can get, and yeah, it'll maybe be a little worse in five years. But the hope part of me says, no, oh, look, there's still these pillars of fair-minded search for truth. Great. All right, as bad as it can get. Let's get some questions from our audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess just for that, what do you think will happen now that Luther has resigned? What do you think will happen now that Rupert has resigned? Uh, Officially retired. I think we'll see more of the same. I think his family isn't really in a position to radically change the model. Uh, I think we're going to see changes at Fox News that just as a result of its aging and its demographics aging out, uh, 
we used to, we used to, because we were in the same building and we had a kind of different mindset, if you will, to put it mildly, um, we would, of course, we had multiple TVs on all the time and uh, in, in our own delusion that we were covering the world, all that. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the, uh, that we used, to, we used to joke about the, the demographic is the, for Fox 2 is, is an angry white man who's 55 years old and lives in East St. Louis. And uh, that, 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 that was just sort of locked it in for us. So I think they, I don't know what their plans are for that. I think the journal uh, just recently in the last year lost its the last uh, sort of domestically educated managing editor, uh, it, it was uh, handed over to somebody from uh, the UK. So that will probably, it won't, it won't affect the business coverage so much of the journal, but I think it will probably, you'll see some of the change in the political coverage or in the sort of Another coverage question. of the news side. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is John Sutter. I used to publish a group of local newspapers in Lower Manhattan. So I have two questions, one on the national level one on the local level. And these are sort of second generation of seeking the truth. Um, on the national level, I was just reading the Washington Post. Do you remember when they had that Pinocchio, the spotter, and they came up with 30,000 untruths during his four years, but about 60 a day or something like that, of untruths. They started calling these, instead of untruths, lies after a while, as the New York Times did. They had to shift into going from untruth to lie. But the question is not so much the truth. These, these are lies, and we know like Trump lies like we breathe. The journalistic question is when do you stop publishing them because it's simply free media that aids in a business? Do you cover Donald Trump even though you know he'd be, uh, be lying? The other day when he went into court in Manhattan, Could you I noticed that. Way he's just his question is that Donald Trump lies all the time. When do you stop publishing or covering him talking? Should you stop publishing or covering and talking? The other morning when he showed up in court in Manhattan, I know that both CNN and MSNBC did not air what he had to say. Fox News covered it its entirety. Uh, what would you say to that, Kurt? Um, it's, 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 it's one of the challenges of the journalism business for the last seven years when you have that going on. I don't think you, sh you say, oh, we will never cover it. It just lies, so we'll never cover it. But I think not, for instance, I, I was watching that as he was making the trial, his trial start late because he was talking to the cameras. Uh, you know, I think it was right probably, or at least it was a fair decision if you're a news channel not to cover it live. But, but, but um, you know, calling out the whoppers or what, you know, I mean, cover, it should be covered, but when you're running a television news channel, what you cover live end to end, or 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 cover later, or 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 have fact check in some fashion in real time, or whatever. Those are the big decisions. It's not a binary one whether they're covered or not. He was the president. He's running for president. Of course, he should be covered. Lies and all. But uh, simultaneous fact checking is very difficult, as we've seen in every interview that he's granted. Uh, yeah. The question is, just cannot keep up. No. You, well, that's why generative AI, once it starts understanding the truth from falsehood and the difference can do a better job. Another question. Yes, sir. Yeah, it, it seems to me that, um, and I wonder if you would agree, that the most damaging example of a, a falsehood or an extreme uh, distortion of the truth is to say that the election that we lost was stolen. Because when you say that, you're telling people that they don't have to listen to anything about the government that's been elected. They have a right, basically, almost to, to violence, which is what happened. And uh, yeah, I, I just wonder if you, if you agree with that and how I mean, how the press deals with that, especially when you've got political parties that decide that the way to get votes is by going along with that statement. John, what would you say to that? You tell them that on a regular basis. Yeah, there were two. Well, one thing was the issue of calling someone um, in high political office a liar or s stating that it is a lie. We, we had many hours of ag agonizing discussion about are we going to go there 
and we eventually did. It took some time. But journalists, uh, when I started it, we didn't even call them journalists, we were just reporters. And uh, it was the position, it was, a, it was a career you chose if you had no other possible <laughs> And then somewhere along the way, we became journalists to start making more money. And, but we're all just like everybody else. And so we have to kind of wrestle with that question of whether to just call, call it right out a blatant liar. And as you now know, everybody has accepted that uh, terminology and it's, it's commonplace. Uh, the, the, I forget the first part of that question. Uh, what was it? Well, just uh, you know, how, how you deal with this most critical of all falsehoods. Right. You're saying that the, the whole government that, that uh, rules the country is yeah. invalid. And we don't have to do yeah, it, the, way, the way we deal with it is to just continually point it out. And what was surprising, I guess, to observe is that a lot of the uh, population uh, doesn't seem to care that it's a lie. It, it just sort of, it's, it's like in this book, uh, in this play, uh, they talk past each other all the time. And I, and I think it's important just to say, uh, apropos Fox News, but the whole right and the whole talk radio, um, right wing talk radio were a lot of which Fox News grew has for 30 or 40 years, as its, you know, expatriate members like Charlie Sykes say, was training and teaching its its people to know the media is lying to you, it's all a liberal hoax, the media is lying to you, it's all a liberal hoax. So naturally, that's where we are. And it's also, just if I can add on, you know, uh, people don't trust the media anymore. And uh, one of the, uh, one of the, the great opportunities for, for me and anybody at the Lakeville Journal or the Millerton News is to be able to change that narrative. And uh, we, we are connecting with every average, everyday people in all the towns. And I think uh, to just bringing back to life what is a really strong local connection to media. So uh, I actually, you know, go into Talk of the Town in, on Route 44 in Millington every Wednesday. And uh, when I first went in there, the, I think they wanted to kick me out. And okay. now they're offering to give me a free sandwich. <laughs> uh, Next you know, question. But it's all about building a relationship with readers. Sir, from this moment to the second Wednesday next November, what do you think will happen? <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, what? <laughs> Our stock tips? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, look, I don't. What do I think is going to happen? I think either we're going to smarten up or we're not, and uh, it doesn't look good so far. I, this, we're having a replay of a nightmare election in my mind. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a strange person to ask about this question, but I will say that I also. I, I, I'm going to go along with the mass right wing conspiracy. And I don't think you should trust the media. I don't think you should trust, but I also don't think you should trust the people who tell you not to trust the media. Uh, I don't think you should trust anyone. I think you should, you should be critical of everything you see and hear, and you should be critical of the little voice in your head that constructs a narrative. I think you should be constantly, I know it's exhausting and I'm sorry, <laughs> it's gonna be difficult until that Tuesday, but keep questioning. Uh, that's the best thing that you can always do. And that's what it means to be uh, human, I would hope, and not just field calves wandering around uh, nibbling on your ass. Next question, sir. Yes, as a historian and a one-time journalist, I sort of hate to uh, acknowledge the conclusion I've come to that really we're fighting the wrong war and we're going to lose it. We define fact against law. But those are both mental evaluations. But it's really a question of information versus persuasion, whether it's visual images or the ability to, through personality, overwhelm an audience. And your question is? We're, we're up against it, of course. We don't have the proper tools to respond to it. If we think we're going to defeat laws, 
quite true. And I think we're barking up the wrong tree and have to find a more effective strategy. David, your play tries to get at that whole issue and we get the truth. And the truth is so important in terms of making decisions and shaping our opinions. As I said at the beginning, when the opinions begin to shape the facts, we're in trouble. Yeah, well, in the play, it's not so much opinions versus facts as that there's an artistic conceit that, um, you know, like a poet or an artist simply has a greater apprehension of the truth and that it's his duty to convey it to people. So in his mind or her mind, it's, it's not an opinion versus fact. It's, it's a vision of the truth that's actually more accurate than any given fact. Um, and so that's the story they're telling themselves that lets, allows them to do this with a good conscience and even more than a good, you know, more than a good conscience, really uh, feeling that they are doing the right thing. It's literally an artistic license. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and it's, it's an artistic license, and, and it, it's, it, I agree, it's an artistic license in that it frees you to do it, but it's also an artistic mission in that it is really what you ought to be doing, and if you don't do it, you're actually failing. You should have a bad conscience if you don't do your best to convey what you view as the truth, you know, which begins to sound like a totalitarian, like Mao or something, you know, I, I hear that, but I need to do it. We've got time for a couple more questions. Sir, in the back. There was a time in maybe the old days, I'm not sure when that was, when the distinction between opinion on the editorial page and facts in the rest of the newspaper was clear and distinct, and people could read it that way. The blurring of those two things in the media to me is part of what's causing the problem, and I'm curious to know if you agree and if you think there's some way that professional journalists and serious newspapers, media, can address that. <coughs> What would you say to that? It's not an easy uh, question to answer. I, I think the, 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 it's not a strict distinction because you don't want, here are the facts, you decide. I mean, it depends on the story. And, 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 and you know, uh, if you're writing Lakeville Journal, I'm sure there are lots of purely fact based stories that do not require analysis about well, what's really true here. But if you're talking about other larger stories, I think having some, again, searching for the truth, fair-minded analysis, not over-partisan, over-opinionated. I, I, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's not an easy thing to, to draw a line between. Um, now, I do think it's an easy thing with the John character, who simply willfully ignores the need for facts, when, factual, actual, factual accuracy when they're available to them. But, but beyond that, it's, I think, in, as you know, as anybody who's been in the racket of journalism knows, it's, it's, it's not, you know, one makes judgments. And I think to get to the truth, uh, readers of journalism want and require judgment, not made up facts or, or Ignoring that factual. Right, the story is to be shaped by the lead, right? 100. And even that's more, your, that's your storyline. And even more in the social media era, where where so many stories consist of the, barely the lead and a headline. Exactly. Another question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, regarding Catherine Hayden, I read maybe 50, maybe 100 letters from her to Lake Journal Times, and they Support team. So they read the articles, they understand what's being said. You have to follow the storyline sometimes over months and years. And the real people who could actually say, oh, we want to issue our opinion, you know, not the editors, not the journalists, not people. We're kind of lacking that infrastructure. Well, I think they publish a fair number of letters to the editors, some of them highly critical of the paper, and they're proud to do that. Yeah, but, 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 you're the voice, and then there's like a call and response. So you're saying something, and we saw that with Sharon Hospital. Unfortunately, it was printed that it was a done deal. And I wrote something, I'm like, well, a done deal, that means we can't do anything. I'm like, so I have to apologize. Well, I, I don't want to debate the facts there, but I do think that the Lakeland Journal and most papers are open to criticism and to other opinions. They seek other opinions. Uh, but yeah, that was pre-stated. But keep writing. Keep writing. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting opportunity for community newspapers like the Journal, because 
because when you think about Fox News and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, these are closed loops. People self-select those media. They're looking for the opinions, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if, when you come to a community newspaper, you're attracting readers of all different um, opinions. And so it's actually an interesting forum to have the ability to you know, peer some of these bubbles with some of some you know, truth-based uh, reporting on issues that are not necessarily local but are national. And you know, it's just an idea of, of how media can actually solve some of this um, some of this you know, self-selecting bubbles that we're in the media right now. Which is the way all media used to be, because starting in the 19th century when to get to be a big newspaper, you had to appeal to people of all partisan ideological stripes. So, you, therefore, there was this century of, oh, we'll be there, and we'll try to do both sides. We'll try to, and, and that, in the, in the modern age, thanks to technology, is no longer, now you can make money just by going for that ideological niche. There you go. But Kurt, wasn't the history of American journalism also the political press? 100%. Absolutely. And very biased, very opinionated. And very small, actually. Until, and, and when when the business changed, you get these giant newspapers and these giant television networks and giant radio networks. That's when true attempts at fairness and, 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 and both sides in a good sense emerged. Great, in my view, uh, uh, you know, achievement of 20th century journalism. Yes, Matt. That um, how we educate kids these days is very important. And a lot of young people don't look at the news. They don't read newspapers. They're getting access from the, you know, their short span. I mean, I have four grandchildren <coughs> speaking to them. Um, and I think that schools can do a lot. And I, I think that teaching journalism or um, what to say the late home journal do for the schools and getting the word Journalism. Well, um, on one level, we, we've had a pretty successful intern program for a long time for college kids. But this year, I think for the first time, we actually had a high school student as a summer intern. There were supposed to be two, but one it only turned out to be one. Uh, and we have been talking, Susan Hassler and I have been talking about creating some kind of a program in terms of distribution to the high school, for the high school students, and for something like new families that come into town, some way of reaching them, if they, especially if they have children, uh, and then also possibly trying to create a newspaper at Pusatonic uh, Valley Regional High School, which doesn't have one, it used to. So that's a very big uh, initiative, uh, but I think we're gonna do it. I'll say one thing about the, uh, the sort of, what you're talking about, the sort of massive uh, newspaper global penetration thing. Uh, when, when the internet was just sort of coming around, uh, I don't know technically exactly how this happened in terms of being a parallel event, but there was something that happened for databases, and it's called full text indexing. And when full text indexing came about, it gave you the opportunity to type in one word, and if the entire database was indexed, you could get your result. And so I knew people at that time who said, this is going to be very dangerous because it's going to become a self-selecting world. We're all going to live in our own bubble because we're going to choose what we want. Then came the algorithms, and now we have AI. So we're, we're in for a real ride here. Right? <laughs> and sadly, I think it's fair to say that like uh, Senator Monaghan said, we are entitled to our own opinions, and we also feel we're entitled to our own facts. Jeremy, thank you. John, Kurt, thank you so much. Thank you.